For those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Wolfram. I am the development manager at the Center for Jewish History. Um, and for those of you who don't, don't know too much about the center, allow me to just say a few things about uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, the Center for Jewish History opened in October 2000, so we are coming up on a very exciting anniversary next year. Uh, the center is home to five distinguished partners, the American Jewish Historical Society, the American Sephardi Federation, the Leo Beck Institute, the Yeshiva University Museum, and the Yibo Institute for Jewish Research. Uh, together, our, the partners' collections comprise the largest Jewish archive outside of Israel. If you haven't been to us before, I invite you to visit us when you're nearby. And if not, please check out our digital collections online. We have over 12 million uh, items already digitized and more every day. Tonight's uh, webinar uh, is being presented in partnership with Vishnik McGovern Malizio, and our featured, spe featured speaker is Morris Saba. Morris is a partner in Vishnik McGovern Malizio's tax law, wills, trusts, and estates, trust and estate planning, and elder law practices. He focuses on the preservation of wealth and administration of estates and trusts and works with high individuals to prevent the dissipation of assets to taxes, creditors, and long-term care expenses. I'd like to give special thanks to Roy Schwartz at VMM for suggesting tonight's program and helping VMM engage with the center uh, this year. Thank you, Roy and Morris, for donating your time and expertise tonight in support of the center. Um, and just for those of you attending, we will have time at the end for a Q&A. Uh, you may use the Q&A button uh, on your screen, on your Zoom screen. Um, or if you want to raise your hand, we can, I can also, uh, you can ask your questions directly uh, as well. Um, with that, Morris, I give it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and welcome, everyone. Tonight, we'll be speaking about charitable uh, planned giving, and I'm going to share my screen with you so that we can see the PowerPoint. Uh, okay. There we go. So the topic is charitable planned giving. Uh, and when we're talking about charitable planning giving, we're talking about uh, filling your philanthropic goals in a smart way. Uh, if anything you get from tonight, the main things that I'd like you to uh, get out of it is to, number one, understand the four different categories of gifts that I'm going to be speaking about, uh, to understand that there are smart ways to gift. There are ways to gift that get more to the charity, get more to your, yourself and to your family uh, in the way of tax deductions and savings. And uh, to just be aware that when you're putting up together a gifting plan, it's a wise idea to consult with your accountant, your attorney, your fina financial advisor, and the charity itself. Uh, the center uh, has people who can help you out and guide you, um, and most charities do, in terms of the different ways to make charitable gifts and uh, how they can be done in a smart way. So to start out, what exactly is charitable plan giving? Charitable plan giving is the integration of recognized income, estate, and gift tax planning techniques to achieve results that benefit the donor and or the donor's heirs, while simultaneously achieving the donor's desired philanthropic goals. In other words, very often we're talking about making charitable gifts that give back to the donor and the donor's heirs by way of significant tax benefits. Or sometimes I like to just call it smart gifting. And we're all, you know, we, we're all familiar with the income tax and uh, how the inf income tax affects us, but some of you might not be very familiar with the gift and estate tax and uh, how that works and some of the upcoming changes that people are concerned about. Uh, I, I saw last week there was a Wall Street Journal article on this that uh, people are running to their estate planning attorneys right now because of the potential changes that are upcoming uh, in the tax laws. So if we just take a look at this screen, um, this top section shows us where we are today. Uh, just to be clear, when we're dealing with spouses, where both spouses are US citizens, we are not gonna have any tax between the spouses. So anything from one spouse to the other who are both US citizens, we're not gonna have a tax 
to be concerned about. So we're usually talking about giving to somebody who's not a spouse, uh, whether it be children, whether it be friends or family. Uh, of course, the, there's a charitable deduction that applies to gifts and at death. Um, so again, when we're looking at these numbers, we're looking at how much can we give tax-free to uh, people other than the, the spouse and the uh, and the charity. Um, so this top line here uh, shows us where we are in 2024. We have a federal estate tax exemption of $13.6 million and a New York state exemption of $6.94 million, which means with the proper planning, uh, two spouses can get out in the, under the current um, scheme, $27.2 million in assets, whether to be the next generation or otherwise, uh, for federal tax purposes, meaning they can give that away without going into the federal estate tax, um, and up to $13.88 million in New York State. So in New York State, the, the numbers are lower, so it's possible to have a New York State estate tax or um, and not uh, a federal estate tax. New York does not currently have a uh, gift tax. The federal government does, but these same numbers apply. However, New York does bring back any gifts that are made within three years of death back into the taxable estate. The next section here is uh, my estimates. Um, uh, they're not going to be exact, but because the uh, estate tax exemptions are um, indexed for inflation, we expect them to go go up so, uh, slightly next year. Uh, so probably a little bit over 14.2 million, double that for two spouses, federal, and New York uh, will probably go somewhere above 7, 7 million, uh, double that or 14 and a half to, to 15 million range. Uh, however, the big change that we're facing is that at the end of 2025, meaning January 1st, 2026, these estate, the federal estate tax exemptions are set to sunset back to they, where they were before uh, the, the numbers were increased. Uh, and we're expecting them to be somewhere in the seven to eight million dollar range. So I have an estimate of mid seven, again, double that. We're at 15.2. So the numbers are going to be drastically different. This will affect some people. It will not, not affect others. Uh, but people who are affected by this or may be affected by this should be thinking about what they can do prior to 2026 to capture these exemptions. Because remember, uh, as I said before, the federal estate tax uh, exemption is a combined exemption with the gift tax exemption. So it could be used during life or at death. Uh, and if if these exemptions are used during lifetime, uh, they stick and you wouldn't necessarily lose them. Uh, so, so that's one thing. The other thing uh, that's an interesting fact in New York that's gotten a lot of attention uh, is uh, the New York State estate tax cliff. And what this is, is it's an interesting uh, fact in the New York State estate tax law that says once you go over our exemption, if you go over by more than five by five percent or more, we're taxing from dollar one. So you can have a small amount over this six point nine million dollar uh, amount in the estate and cause a large tax. So on my next screen. Um, I've given you an example here. So this is an estate at $7.3 million, and there's no charitable deduction, no, nothing going to charity. Uh, we have a New York state tax of $678,000. So again, we, we're only a little bit over the exemption. We're over by about $700,000, but we have a $678,000 tax payable to New York. So what can we do with that? So, so what's been developed by estate planners is something that we call the Santa Clause. And this Santa Clause is a provision that is a charitable provision. Um, and I'm going to go over it in a second. But 
the reason I'm I'm showing this example first is because it really shows how powerful uh, charitable plan giving can be. Even so for somebody who's not in New York, it's a good example to see. So this is the with this Santa Claus. So if I'm going to have a Santa Claus in my will, I'm going to say, hey, if I'm in this range of $7.3 million or a little bit higher than that, I'm going to take whatever I have to take to give to charity to bring that exemption down so that my, my family gets more. So in this case, I'm giving $360,000 to the charity, resulting in a $6,940,000 to the family, $360,000 to the charity, which means the family is getting $318,000 more than what they would have received if there was no charity involved. This is a very powerful thing. Anybody who's in New York, who's a New York State resident, and who falls within this range should be including this type of provision in their, in their will. So you could see how powerful some of these things can be. So moving back to the four different types of charitable gifts that I'm going to speak about. Uh, the first one being outright gifts to charity. It's a gift during lifetime to the charity. Um, and there's different ways to do that. The second one being a charitable gift at death. And I'll talk about those, but you could think about wills, beneficiary designations, and the like. Uh, the third category is where you're giving an income stream to the charity. But the donor is going to get the asset back or their heirs are going to get the asset back. And the fourth category is where you're going to keep the income stream or you're going to give the income stream to your family or to your other beneficiaries. And uh, the charity um, is going to get the asset at the end. So the different types of categories and these last two can be included in a will, they can be included in a trust, or they can be done during lifetime. So let's start with one example of an outright gift to charity. Uh, in this example, we're talking about long-term appreciated stock. And with long-term appreciated stock, and we're making a gift of long-term appreciated stock to uh, a charity, we can take a deduction for the full fair market value of that stock without recognizing capital gain. So look what happens if instead we have, we have a donor who wants to give to charity, but also has stock that they were planning to sell. So in this case, we have $100,000 in stock and they're anticipating a $25,000 long-term capital gain. If they sell the stock, they pay the capital gain and now they have $75,000 to give to charity. They make the gift to charity of $75,000. The charity now has $75,000 and the donor gets an income tax deduction of $75,000. But look what happens if instead of doing that, we give the stock to the charity, okay? So here we have, instead of selling the stock, we're going to give the stock to the Center for Jewish History, $100,000 in stock, the center is going to sell that and not pay taxes on it, and they're receiving $100,000. The donor is receiving full fair market value as a deduction, so the donor is getting $100,000 in deductions. Other examples of uh, outright charitable gifts, qualified charitable distributions. This is where you're going, if somebody who's over age seven and a half, is going to gift uh, a portion of their IRA to the charity. It, co it can qualify or count towards the required minimum distribution, and it does not show up as part of the adjusted gross income of that individual. Um, other types are, you know, gifts of life insurance policies to the charity, setting up endowment funds, setting up foundations, donor advised funds. These are all outside gifts, but just let's focus on this qualified charitable distribution. We could imagine if you're lowering the uh, adjusted gross income of a high uh, a wealthy individual who has a high income tax bracket, that's going to bring down maybe their their bracket. They're going to you're going to take it off the top, and 
the fact that they're in a, they're going to have a lower adjusted gross income also means that they might qualify for more deductions that are uh, would have they would have lost with that extra income that they're required to take because it's a required minimum distribution. So let's just take an example. And here I want to show that even if somebody is not well, uh, very high income, um, they can get some sub substantial benefits. In this situation, we have income of $100,000. That's the non-retirement, non-IRA income. And we have a required minimum distribution of $30,000. So the, it, with no charitable contribution, we have a total adjusted gross income of $130,000. The person is going to give that thirty thousand. They they're going to they're not they're not giving the uh, uh, money directly from the IRA. They're just going to take it as a required minimum distribution, report it, and it becomes part of their AGI. And therefore, they have total income of one hundred thirty thousand dollars. But then they're going to give thirty thousand dollars to the charity. So now they're going to take a deduction of thirty thousand dollars with net taxable income of one hundred thousand dollars and a tax of roughly seventeen thousand dollars. But if instead of doing that, they took that 30,000 required minimum distribution and directed it directly to the charity, now this person's adjusted gross income is only $100,000. They're now gonna be able to take the standard deduction because they're not itemizing anymore. And they have net tax, taxable income 80, of $84,300 for a tax of 13,853. But wait a minute. There's more than that because the Medicare premiums are calculated based upon adjusted gross income. So in this case, this person is going to cut her adjust her uh, Medicare premium in half from 349.40 a month to 174.70 a month, with giving that this this uh, donor an extra two thousand dollar of savings. In the uh, in the year that it's calculated. Now, looks like let's look at a charitable gift at death, and this is a uh, an example of a charitable gift, and this I see all the time. This is a very common thing we come that uh, that we see. Um, client comes in with a uh, plan for distribution. They want to write their will, and they say, you know what, I want to give a certain amount to charity. Uh, and in this case, $100,000 to the charity. So they put, they're going to put $100,000 request in their will. However, they have a, an IRA and the IRA is going to the daughter, which means that when the daughter withdraws that money, they're going to be paying income tax. In this case, in this example, we're estimated in tax at $40,000. So if I give the daughter, make the daughter the beneficiary of this IRA, when she withdraws it out, assuming she withdraws it all in one year, she's going to have a $40,000 tax and her net from that IRA is going to be only $60,000. Charity is going to get $100,000 under the will. If we did it this way, where the IRA monies are going to the charity and the cash bequest under the will or increasing the bequest under the will to the daughter by $100,000. The daughter gets the full $100,000. The IRA goes to the charity. Charity gets $100,000, not paying tax on it. Other gift, other ideas dealing with charitable gifts at death, bequests in a will, or naming the charity as beneficiary on a life insurance policy. The next category that I want to talk about is providing for a stream of income to the charity where the donor or the donor's heirs are keeping the asset or will eventually receive the asset. This is called the charitable lead trust. There are two kinds. One is a charitable lead annuity trust, and the other one is a charitable lead uni trust. The difference is that with a charitable lead annuity trust, we're giving a fixed dollar amount to the charity every year. And uh, upon the termination of the uh, trust, the uh, the asset 
is going to the family or is going to be given to the uh, uh, is going coming back to the to the donor. Um, these are used to transfer appreciating assets to heirs while providing income to charity. You can get significant gift and estate tax deductions. Um, you can it can be done during life or after death. Uh, it can be designed to provide income tax deduction in the year of the gift. And it can be effective to make charitable gifts greater than the individual's tax limit. So an example that I had with one client, a particular client is where he was giving more than his uh, allowed amounts to charity every year. This individual is in real estate. He has a lot of charitable, a lot of deductions because of uh, the depreciation. So he was going over his limits. So he set up a certain type of charitable lead trust where the income never hits his tax return. Uh, it goes directly to the charity. And therefore, he was able to get more to the charity without it ever showing up on his tax return and therefore increasing how much he was getting as a benefit from that charitable deduction. In this case, it was pretty much a charitable exclusion because of the way it was designed. So here's an example of a 20-year annuity to charity and then upon termination to the children. Uh, 20 years would be the maximum an, an, uh, annual uh, number of years that you can do it, or it can be done, done for a life or lives. In this case, we're making a 20-year annuity to charity. Uh, we're putting in $2 million and we're taking back an annuity of 100,000 or we're giving to the charity $100,000 a year from this asset. We expect this asset to grow by 7% a year. We're gonna take up, uh, we're going to get a charitable deduction against the gift of $1,267,630, which means the gift uh, amount is gonna be a little bit over $700,000 of exemption that we're going to use. Um, now, Again, this can be set up so there's an upfront income tax deduction as well, depending on how it's set up. And I'm not gonna get into the complexities of it, but for some people, it's better off to get the deduction and for others, it's not. But because of the expected growth rate here, we expect the children at the end of this trust, this 20 year trust, to have an asset worth $3,640,000. So for a little bit of a seven, over $700,000 in exemption used or gift tax paid if you're over your exemptions, uh, we're getting an asset worth eventually $3.6 $3 .6 million to the children. The, Next category of gifts is our gifts of assets to charity where the donor or the donor's heirs keep the income stream. And these are called charitable remainder trusts. It's kind of like the reverse of the charitable lead trust. We have charitable annuity trust and charitable uh, uni trust, one being a fixed dollar amount and the other being a percentage of the assets in the trust um, each year. Uh, the assets are, to be, are held by a trustee that's appointed by the donor. They get a partial income tax deduction in the year of the gift. A big factor here is that there's no capital gain on the transfer of appreciated assets into the charitable remainder trust. However, there is going to be income recognized over the, the term of the trust as money comes back either to the donor or to the family. Um, the annuity could be for one or more lives for up to a term of 20 years. Uh, we get a gift or a state tax deduction for a portion of asset passing to charity. It can be done during life or at death. So we can do this in a will as well. Uh, and it can be, and, and this last uh, point I want to make is very often people want to combine this with uh, life insurance. So they'll take a portion of the money that's coming back to them and buy life insurance with it because they want to ensure that even if the asset does not increase in value, the family, um, either at the end of the term or at death, um, in this case, if we're dealing with life insurance at death, will get something back. So an example here, we have a couple age seven and 71 and 74, 
they do not have children, but they want to they have they want to reach their philanthropic goals. Uh, so they decide they want to give this asset to um, to the charity um, after their their long life. So um, they put in this asset worth two million dollars. And they're going to take back ten thousand dollars a month, so they're going to have from this trust one hundred twenty thousand dollars in income uh, generated. They're going to take a charitable deduction because of that remainder that the charity will eventually get of six hundred fifty-seven five hundred dollars. So typically, this is going to be done in a year when these people are expecting to have a large income coming in. So they're going to make the gift. They're going to take. The charitable deduction in the year with the large income, so they kept the full benefit of that uh, charitable deduction, and then they're still going to be getting money back over their lifetimes. So that's an ex example of charitable remainder trust. Another type I'm not going to get involved in, too into uh, with you is uh, a charitable gift annuity. It's very similar to the charitable uh, remainder trust. However, in this case. The um, the donor is uh, not in control. The trust is not set up by the donor. It's uh, an annuity set up by the charity itself. Some charities have it, not all charities do. Um, and similarly, money is coming back to the donor for a period of time, and then eventually the asset goes to the uh, to the charity. Again, four classes of charitable gifts. Outright gifts to charity, charitable gifts at death, gifts of an income stream to the charity with the donor or donor's heirs keeping the asset, or a gift of the asset to charity with the donor or the heirs of the donor keeping an income stream. I'm going to open it up to questions. Do we have anybody joining us tonight with a question? So you can use the Q&A or raise your hand. I will unmute you. Ah, we have one question. Hi there. Oops. Well, that's Hi. a picture made from 50 years ago. <laughs> um, the uh, QCD I saw in one of your slides was uh, 105,000. Did that increase recently? It, um, it's it's the it's 105 percent. Oh, okay. Percent of what? Oh, I'm sorry, 105 thousand dollars. Yeah, they increased it each year. They increase it. So it went up to 105 thousand this year. Yes. Oh, good to know. Okay. Okay. It means I give more. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hey, anybody else uh, with a question? Yehuda. So the the four hundred one k is um, is considered for all purposes a part of the estate. Is that right? It's part of the taxable estate. Is correct. So the, in other words, so there's a, if there's a Roth component that is not taxable, and if the um, but in terms of the of these um, minimum amounts, uh, or in terms of these exemptions, does the um, any Roth component also count towards the value of the estate? You said did you say Roth? Roth. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, uh, yes, it would be. Even though it's not income tax, uh, taxable, you still include it as part of the taxable estate. Okay, so for the for the uh, exemptions, it would be counted in as part of the taxable estate. Well, yeah, that's correct. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Anyone else? Okay, 
Well, thank you all very much for joining us tonight. And thank you, Morris, for your presentation. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Really lived up to its name. So thank you. Okay. And uh, for, uh, for those of you who joined us, a recording will be available um, not, not too long after this. So we'll be sure to share that with all of you as well for reference. Um, so thank you. Okay. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Morris. Thank night. you, guys.